Welcome to video three, where we're going to cover some additional 11AX enhancements and uh, talk about 11AX throughput, what we can expect, what's realistic, uh, a little bit about the math, etc. We'll start with the enhancements. There, there are several, and we'll go ahead and jump right in. This chart shows uh, some information about guard interval efficiency. It starts by showing the FFT size, Fast Fourier Transform size, that is the number of subcarriers within a 20 megahertz wide channel. 11A, G, N, and AC all had 64 subcarriers in a 20 meg channel, whereas 11AX, because uh, the subcarriers have been divided by four, which is the second line here, divided by uh, four uh, in width, have been has given us 256 uh, subcarriers, or in this case, tones, uh, per 20 meg channel. The width of those are 78.125, so they're quite narrow. This gives us very granular control over the widths of the, uh, the, the resource units. The number of data carrying subcarriers in 11AG was 48. Uh, N and AC with HTOFDM gave us 52, which, you know, it's a 7 or 8% uh, increase in efficiency, not bad. Uh, but then, of course, uh, we've now, since we've broken these, um, these subcarriers uh, by into fourths, uh, th there's 234 of these being used for carrying um, carrying data. Now, if you want to do a direct comparison, you would simply divide 234 by four, and you could see that even still in a 200 uh, uh, in a 242 tone uh, in, entire channel, 20 megahertz channel, it's still more efficient uh, than it would be uh, using 11 N and AC. As far as efficiency goes, the you know about 75% with OFDM with HTOFDM, it's about 81%. So that's you know that's a reasonable gain, and then it gets uh, significantly more, about 10% more gain with 11AX. The OFDM symbols um, have been the data portion of that is 3.2 microseconds out of a four or 3.6 depending on long and short guard interval. Uh, uh, so the symbol could be 4.0 or 3.6 microseconds long, but 3.2 is always the usable portion. The same is true in 11N and 11AC, but in 11AX we use uh, maximum size 16 microsecond uh, symbol time. So we have three options here. 12.8 is always going to be the usable portion, but then we have our guard intervals of 0.8, 1.6, and 3.2 microseconds instead of the, the standard 0.8 and uh, 0.4 for uh, standard and uh, short guard intervals. Now you may not recognize 0.8 and 0.4 microseconds, but those are 800 nanoseconds and 400 nanoseconds is the way we generally represent the guard interval lengths. So we will typically on indoor environments be using a standard uh, 800 nanosecond or 0.8 microsecond guard interval, uh, but the symbol time itself is much longer. The usable portion has gone up by 4x to 12.8 microseconds. And then the efficiency at the, at the bottom, you can see that if we're using the 0.8 microseconds uh, along with the 12.8 microsecond symbol uh, data portion of the symbol time for a total of 13.6 microseconds, the efficiency has been driven from about 80% all the way up to 94%. That's a pretty big gain. Now, what about 11AX and 2.4 gig? There's been a lot of talk about this. Some limitations. One is that we're no longer allowed to use one and two megabit uh, per second data rates with 11AX, which is great because we don't want to use those anyway. We typically use uh, you know, 12 megabit minimum basic rate. Some people like to go ahead and use the standard OFDM defaults of 6, 12, and 24, and that's fine too. But one and two won't be supported, which is excellent. Um, there's, there's some other considerations here, and that is even though we can divide a 20 megahertz 2.4 gig channel uh, nine ways with, uh, with uh, up to nine 26 tone transmissions at a time, the problem is, is the band is so already so busy, so dirty, uh, there's so many clients, there's so, uh, so much interference sources, things like this. Uh, and each one of those legacy clients, as they transmit, they use the entire 20 megahertz channel. Or if they're a legacy 11B, they'll be using a 22 megahertz wide channel. And so it wouldn't be until we could get rid of the B, uh, G, and N clients in 2.4 gig until we would start to see 
uh, significant 2.4 gig gains with 11AX. And of course, that would also mean uh, we would have to do away with interference sources. All of those, those uh, items, the BGN clients, the non-Wi-Fi interference sources are not going away anytime soon, pro probably ever. So 11AX and 2.4 gigahertz is, uh, while it will function, of course, it's not likely to offer any significant gains other than uh, you know protocols like TWT for power save, which we'll discuss later. But as far as being able to drive more efficiency, it's very unlikely. As we talked about in the chart a couple of slides ago, uh, we've got uh, uh, typically a 4.0 uh, or a 3.2 microsecond symbol time, depending on uh, standard guard intervals or short guard intervals. And we typically re reference those as 400 nanoseconds or 800 nanoseconds. As you can see in the, the top graphic on the left, you've got symbol time followed by guard interval uh, time. So the symbol actually, uh, the symbol time that we're showing here in kind of a light purple is the data portion of the symbol. It's not, uh, it's not uh, standalone because the guard interval is actually part of the symbol. And so what we're showing here is uh, that we've got, let's say if we were using uh, a 3.6 uh, microsecond symbol time, the symbol would be 3.2, the guard interval would be 0.4. And so this, this is uh, how this normally works. And, and of course, if we've got the guard interval sized properly, we won't have inter-symbol interference. We won't have uh, symbols that are taking another path, a, a reflective path, and then bouncing toward the receiver and being ar arriving at uh, the same time as the next symbol. Uh, we, we certainly don't want symbols to overlap. That's the reason for the guard interval. At the bot on the bottom graphic, we can see an illustration of inter-symbol interference where a reflected copy of symbol one is still on the air when symbol two is transmitted uh, via direct path. And so there's not enough guard interval there to prevent the ISI and those symbols will collide and cause interference for each other. So what we would need to do is simply increase uh, the guard interval size from, let's say, for example, from short to standard and from 400 to, to 800. And in, in most cases indoors, the, the, uh, the reflections from a transmission are going to take no more than about 50 nanoseconds to, uh, to be absorbed uh, into the surrounding environment, to all the reflections to be gone and dissipated. So even 400 is often overkill. But uh, 800 is certainly overkill, and we never use anything like that in the in the real world, and you know, in real transmissions. For more uh, detailed um, overview of this, I've put a nice link at the bottom. It goes into a lot of the math, but it's uh, very helpful. Well, how does that compare with 11 AC? We were using uh, standard and short guard intervals of 800 and 400 nanoseconds in 11 N and 11 AC. As you can see in the, uh, the graphic on the screen here, we have 3.2 microseconds of data portion all the time, but then we have these different guard interval lengths in 11N and 11AC. But 11AX uses a, uh, a, a maximum of 16 microseconds, but indoors we're typically going to use the 13.6 microsecond data portion along with an 800 nanosecond or 0.8 microsecond uh, guard interval. This will be the typical deployment. So that's what we've represented here. And why is this such a big deal? Well, it adds efficiency. Instead of going, um, you know, data portion of the symbol, then guard interval, data portion, guard interval, over and over, where over the course of about 16 microseconds, we have all of this dead time, all of this useless time there. Now, there's still transmissions there, but they're they're essentially padding. They're essentially a uh, uh, bad data that is known to be bad data just to keep the transmitter transmitting so that we don't have to turn it off. And so uh, it is more efficient when we just have that, uh, that single guard interval at the end of a longer symbol time. Additionally, the use of these longer OFDM symbols uh, of, let's say, for example, the 13.6 plus 0.8, um, allows for larger coverage areas as your system becomes more robust to propagation delays and the longer guard intervals decrease the inner symbol interference. So that's why we don't have a 400 nanosecond uh, option when using 11AX natively. For coding updates, coding is our forward error correction. Uh, previously, 
Um, BCC has been kind of the go-to, the default for forward error correction in 11N and 11AC. And low density parity checking being much more efficient has been an optional uh, uh, configuration. But with 11AX, LDPC is now required for MCS 10 and MCS 11 when you're using 1024 QAM uh, or anything that's equal to 242 RUs or larger. So in other words, an entire 20 meg channel or larger for, for the uh, uh, the forward error correction will be always be LDPC. Now LDPC is much more efficient than BCC. Um, it uh, you know it closes in on the Shannon limits, uh, which is for performance, which is great. It's very simple decoding um, and uh, and so on. So there's a, a lot of uh, benefit here, but it's been optional uh, up until 11 AX, and now it's going to be mandatory for certain scenarios. BCC will still be supported, of course. 11A, G, and N have always achieved a maximum of 64 QAM, which is six bits per symbol. With 11AC, we were able to implement 256 QAM modulation, provided we had enough SNR, which gave us even more efficiency at eight bits per symbol. And now 11AX is going further with 1024 QAM maximum. Of course, each of these are backwards compatible to each of the uh, previous um, uh, types of modulation, all the way down to BPSK. Uh, with uh, 1024 QAM having 10 bits per symbol. As you can see in the, the graphics at the bottom, the, um, the error vector magnitude between the, uh, the points on the chart are very, very small. They, they're tiny, which requires uh, a very large SNR, as we will see in the, the following slide. So clients are going to have to be close to the access points in order to achieve 1024 QAM. Uh, at a full 242 uh, tone. But uh, as of revision three of the draft, that requirement of 242 tone or greater to use 1024 or QAM seems to have been removed, which means that with uh, eight, four, and two megahertz widths, uh, this will give us more SNR quickly. With uh, 26 tone being around two megahertz wide, that's gonna add about 10 dB of SNR due to a noise floor drop of about 10 dB. So that would be quite nice if it stays this way in, um, in the final revision uh, of the amendment. Now we talked about 1024 QAM uh, allowing us up to 10 bits per symbol, which is about a 25% uh, peak data rate increase, which is quite nice. But of course, we're going to have to have more SNR. If you looking at the chart at the bottom, we've added the 1024 QAM MCS 10 and 11 there. And you can see that we've gone from around an, uh, thir neg 30, neg 32 for 256 QAM up to neg 35 for 1024 QAM. That's a lot of SNR that's required there. Now, as the channels get more narrow uh, than 20 megahertz, the noise floor starts uh, dropping, which is great. As you uh, half the channel width, you're also dropping your noise floor by 3 dB. If you cut your uh, channel width by 10 times or down to 1 tenth, you've dropped it by 10 dB. So um, if, you, if you look at the graphic at the bottom right, you can see that when the noise floor drops, the SNR increases. So that's where using these 26, 52, 106 tone RUs will give us pretty good SNR and may allow us to achieve to achieve the 1024 QAM modulation and therefore 10 bits per symbol, giving us higher data rates even on those uh, smaller RUs. Now let's look at the math uh, requirements here. We mentioned the the minus 35. Let's let's look at free space path loss on the top graphic. You see a line going from the access point to the client here. Note that th these numbers are loss in dB at five gigahertz. So at one meter, we're gonna lose 47 dB. And then we go out to two meters, we'll lose another six, which will be a total of minus 53 dB. When we double again, uh, we're gonna go out to four meters. Then it'll be another minus six going to minus 59 dB of loss. And this math is called the inverse square law. So five gig loses that neg 47 in the first meter, but, uh, and 2.4 loses minus 40 dB in the first meter. But thereafter, it's minus six for every distance doubling. So going on out to eight meters, it would be a cumulative total of minus 65 and so on. 
Now looking at the next chart is uh, note here that it, there's no walls uh, or any uh, objects to be penetrated here, doors, humans, or anything. This is only free space path loss. And the next chart is, notice the values are in DBM. This, these are RSSI values in DBM. Also notice that our access point is on channel 36 at a plus 10 DBM EIRP. So in doing that math, if we go to one meter, plus 10 minus 47 is minus 37 dBm of signal strength. And then it would be minus six, minus six, minus six after that for every distance doubling from one to two, two to four, and four to eight meters. So we could expect if our access point was at 10 dBm on a, on a five gig channel, uh, 10 dBm EIRP, and at eight meters in free space path loss, we would expect to receive uh, from the math, just purely the math, not considering the the sensitivity of the client, a minus 55 dBm signal strength. Now, considering a noise floor, a typical noise floor in five gig of neg 90, which it could be better than that. I mean, I've seen it be in the high neg 80s and I've seen it be in the high neg 90s. And so if, if it were just a kind of a nominal neg 90, then that means at eight meters, we would have achieved our 1024 qualm um, requirement of 35 dB S and R. That is minus 55 from minus 90 gives us that 35 dB. So that would have uh, been reasonable to achieve. And eight meters from the center of a room uh, is a fairly large room. So this, this certainly um, uh, is achievable, this 1024 qualm without being all, you know, all over the top of the AP with your client. And when it comes to data rates in 11AX, the data rates are going to be based on... So in the next section, 11AX throughput, we're going to talk about some of the math, some of the things that drive uh, efficiency, what should we expect, what's some of the misinformation and things like this. So we'll go ahead and get started. How we achieve efficiency and therefore a greater system-wide and per-client throughput today is by division uh, of contention domains and and the primary way that we do this is through more narrow channels a lot of folks uh, like 80 meg channels because they produce high data rates but in reality uh, what they do is produce uh, high latency and low throughput when there are lots of clients trying to transmit everyone has to wait in a single file line uh, behind every client no matter how fast or slow that client goes so so even though they have high data rates, uh, they don't do very well with high contention. Uh, wide channels are great for low contention. You can get very high throughput per client in low contention, but most enterprises today are very high contention uh, scenarios. Well, how do we uh, get more capacity today? We divide contention domains by making narrower channels, and you can see moving from 80 all the way down to 20 is what we typically do in, in uh, enterprises. So you can see as we continue that analogy going to 20 uh, down to as narrow as 26 tone RUs in 11AX, it allows for uh, lots of clients to be transmitting or being transmitted to by the access point. This is much more efficient, efficient and applications and devices will get just what they need at that time for the applications they're running and the applications needs uh, according to SLAs. This slide gives us some of the real world numbers uh, that we can expect uh, of a 20 megahertz wide channel. This, the, the math here is for 11 AC uh, clients and of course access point uh, providing 31 plus dB of SNR so that they can achieve MCS9. It's important to note that ch uh, channels will saturate around 75 to 80%. And so 100% is not achievable on a channel due to your protocol overhead. Now, what we're looking at on the left side here is um, from, the, from the bottom to the top is smartphones that are one spatial stream capable, tablets that are two spatial stream capable, and laptops that are three spatial stream capable. Again, starting at the bottom, if you take these one by one devices and you give them one megabit of throughput each at, um, at MCS, uh, the maximum MCS for their capability, you would get about 30 devices uh, before your airtime would saturate between 75 and 80 percent. 
that gives you about 30 megs of throughput on the channel before saturation happens. So, you know, we like to talk about needing gigabit ports or some folks talk about needing 2.5 gigabit ports and, and dual 5 gigabit ports and so on and so on. When the reality is the airtime will saturate so far be, before you get to those numbers that it's, uh, it's not realistic to, uh, to say that we need a gig or 2.5 gig or 5 gig or so on. Uh, some variations here. If you went to those same uh, smartphones, one by one smartphones, two megs each. Uh, two megabits of throughput each. You can only have 15 devices before you would reach saturation and it would still be around 30 megs and three megs at 10 devices, same thing. So the, the throughput capability of a channel really de is most dependent on the client devices uh, spe specifications. So the higher end those client specifications are, the better off you're gonna be for aggregate throughput. Now, if all of those client devices were two by twos, you could start at in the middle here and say two megs each, about 32 devices before you would saturate the channel. Three megs each, 21, still about roughly 65 megs, and four megs each, about 16 devices before saturation. And even still, that would consider you had to have all two by two devices. Now, in reality, three by three devices are 1% or less of your average enterprise, usually less. And so uh, they're only the highest end laptops that have three by three adapters in them. And of course, if they were all, every adapter you had or every client device you had were three by three, then you could say, well, I can get uh, about 50 devices at two megs, um, you know, 33 at three and 25 at four megs before I could saturate the channel and it would saturate at roughly 100 megs. So what does this mean? Well, if most cl clients are a mix of two by two, uh, most um, enterprises are, have a mixture of clients between two by two and one by one, then that means our aggregate throughput on an access point radio, this is on a per radio basis, uh, radio would be somewhere between 30 and 65. And even if you had an almost optimal environment of all two by twos, you could say, well, my radio would saturate at about 65 megs. And if you ha had either a very, very clean 2.4 gig environment or a dual five gig, then you could multiply these numbers by two uh, and be pretty safe. But even still, optimally, that's 65 times two. Uh, real world is probably a lot less than that due to 2.4 gig interference or you know things like this. So when we design, we typically look at uh, the mix of one by one and two by two devices um, as about a 50-50 mix. Now over the course of the next you know, four or five years, you would expect that most client devices would be two by twos except for IoT devices. And of course, if we can keep IoT over on 2.4 a lot of the time and keep our, you know, corporate devices on five gig, then this would certainly give us, um, you know, uh, more throughput through these radios. Uh, this, this is going to apply whether it's you know, this, this applies for 11AC, but we can drive as much as four times this if we have a purely 11AX environment. And that's that's where we're going with this. I want to set, uh, you know, proper expectations for throughput due to the misinformation that we, we currently see out there. All right, for backhaul speed, how much do we need? One gigabit is all you need. In fact, in fact, the fastest um, throughput I've ever seen is when the traffic is from a single three by three client. It's all UDP traveling in one direction to, uh, let's say from a client device to an access point uh, to a NAS that has SSDs and lots of RAM in the front. So it's not having to uh, directly take it to hard drive. Uh, I've seen it reach one gigabit per second. Uh, but again, that's one client, perfectly clean environment, 80 meg channel, uh, a, you know, special scenario uh, of, of the server that it's copying the data to. All of that is, uh, that's a corner case. It's not real world, it's not the enterprise. So any hype that says that we need, you know, multi gig on an access point, uh, because we're going to be going well over that gig is simply not true. And that's easily proved out by, by monitoring. And, and so monitoring the throughput through your APs and uh, controllers and so on. Now, one of these days, we're certainly going to get to the point where we're adding new physical layers like 11AD or 11AY that it's going to drive the need for 2.5 gig uh, or so because they have extremely high data rates and um, and that you know that should be able to achieve well over a gig. But today's access points, even 11AX, are not upgradable to 11AD or 11AY. So that's a whole new generation of APs. 
But I mean, if, if your access points already come with 2.5 gig on them, well, there's you know no need to complain. You have the speed if you need it, but you simply won't need it in the enterprise scenarios. The reality here is with a 50-50 mix of one spatial stream and two spatial stream clients, your throughput on a per radio basis will land somewhere between 30 and 65 megs of throughput maximum before the channel saturates. I've written a, uh, a long blog on this and the link is at the top right. Another important technology that goes along with 11AX is dual 5 gigahertz. Dual 5 gigahertz access points will exist in three flavors. Um, the first is the two radio flavor where one 5 gig radio is fixed at 5 gig and the other software definable and switchable to 5 gig and 2.4. The next is the three radio flavor, which will have uh, two five gig fixed radios and a two four fixed radio. And lastly, the four radio uh, variant, which will be uh, five gig fixed, five gig fixed, two four fixed, and a, and a bi or I'm sorry, a, a dual band uh, scanner radio. Now it's important to understand that even two radio, uh, some two radio access points with 11 AX uh, will exceed the dot three AT uh, PoE budget especially those that have uh, 8x8 variant uh, 11AX radios. They pull a tremendous amount of power, and we expect you know, somewhere in the 40 to 50 watt range in a lot of cases. Now, when we get into three radio units, you can expect at least the 50 watt range. And, and then, of course, we go on up into four radios, and we're going to start to see uh, class three uh, dot three BT, which is 60 watt maximum, start to be you know start to come into play. Of course, we have a class four 90 watt variant of PoE that uh, we'll see in the future, but a lot of switches early on are going to be uh, the class three variant. So we'll see a lot of the the uh, you know two and possibly three radios. I don't know how many four radios we're going to see for a while, unless they're four by four, four by four, four by four plus scanner, and maybe they'll fit you know nicely into a class three. POE.3 uh, BT budget. Addition, additionally, uh, in dual 5 gigahertz, some uh, steering mechanisms are going to be absolutely necessary. I haven't talked to anyone uh, yet in the you know product team across multiple vendors that isn't considering this. And that is, we need to be able to isolate legacy uh, 5 gigahertz phis from 11AX on 5 gigahertz. For example, 11AN and AC clients need to go to one radio, one 5 gig radio, and usually that radio would be uh, on a, uh, a non-DFS channel uh, in a typical design. And then the 11AX clients would need to be steered to the other 11AX radio, which would be operating on DFS. Uh, channels in a typical design. In separating them, we get speed on the 11 um, AC radio, or the radio may be 11 AX capable, but it houses the 11 AC, N, and A clients. On that radio, we get speed, but on the uh, 11 AX access point radio that is housing the or, or connecting associating the 11 AX clients we get efficiency so one is efficient one is fast and that that separation will become necessary because otherwise uh, in in mixing these two we end up with uh, the worst of both we don't get you know very fast on 11 AC and we don't get very efficient on 11 AX so we need to be able to greenfield and that's what we typically call this is a greenfielding steering mechanism okay so we typically will pair up DFS and non-DFS channels across uh, dual 5 gig uh, uh, access points so that we can have so that we can accommodate the, the uh, client devices that are not DFS capable. Okay. Now having multiple radios like three and four radio APs are going to enable some flexible design characteristics like uh, for example turning them into scanners or having one radio be a mesh uh, or something like this but of course having three or four radios is going to require more power so definitely it, um, in those cases it'll be pushing the very limits of dot three AT and probably going well on into a dot three BT budget 
Now, how much throughput do we see in the real world? We talked about maximums, but what about what's real? You know, we talked about channel saturation at a 30, 65, and 100, depending on the, the client specs. Uh, and of course, a lot of um, a lot of folks will be touting, uh, especially vendors are going to be touting, um, you know, you need 2.5 gig, you need 5 gig, you need dual 5 gig, but we've already seen that that's just simply not the case. Um, so what's real? Well, this, this data on screen shows you a sample of 60,000 APs across multiple vertical markets. It's one giant sample and it's divided up into 2.4 gig and 5 gig. The 2.4 gig is on the left and the 5 gig is on the right. And the purple line, the, the, the uh, oscillating line there, is the downlink and the blue is the uplink. And you can see that on 5 gigs, we're averaging about 1 megabit per second downlink. It's going a little bit over that, but not much on average. We call that a peak average. And those light peaks are going up to about 4 mags. You know, not quite 4 mags, 3.5 mags. Uh, and this is over the course of a week uh, across vertical mark, uh, multiple vertical markets, healthcare, education, so on, at about 60,000 AP. So this is a very nice sample. And then on 2.4, about a meg and a half. And so we could expect, and this was taken about a year ago, so even if we just very generously doubled these numbers, we could say that, um, you know, one, um, you know, that's one mag uh, on five gigs, so we'll double it to two, and 1.5 will double that to three. So we've now got five mags uh, going down link on, on an access point if we doubled these numbers. And that's just simply not very much. And it's all due to contention. And of course, this, we can see this, uh, that it's only ever getting above the one meg line during, during business hours. And so at night, of course, there's nobody there, it's not doing much, and you're gonna have much lower numbers. And then, it, even though we doubled it just to take, uh, you know, take the time off the off the table and say this is, you know, for current, that's five megs. What if we then had a, a greenfield scenario of 11 ax and multiplied uh, this by four, and where everything there was all 11 ax on both bands? Well, if you multiplied five megs times four, you get 20 megs. 20 megs, not uh, a gig, and not 2.5 gigs. And we're not even taking into consideration, you know, a lot of cases, um, you know, the um, excessive channel contention, the AP CPU limits, RF interference sources that come and go, any suboptimal data rate use because drivers are not very good, um, you know, especially the, the cheap consumer stuff. And uh, a lot of retransmissions can happen. You got a big mixture of clients there. There's just so much that can go on that can, uh, can bring your throughput down. So this is more of the real world versus the theoretical maximums. So this is the end of video three. In the, the next video, we're going to talk about unproven features, uh, 11AX's biggest challenges, and when to upgrade. Thank you very much for attending.